That's why when the Fed makes a statement, the latest employment numbers hit, or the real estate boards publish last month's sales or its earnings season, it's important that someone put on their Cinecat and tries to drill into those numbers in search of the deeper insights. Now, being cynical can earn one a reputation as a bear, but if you don't understand the risks of blindly trusting the headlines, then you don't understand the risks you're taking with your investments. Larry does a great job of looking at risk and return, but few do it better than this week's special guest, David Rosenberg. For those of you who don't know who David is, and I'm guessing there aren't too many of you who don't, David is the Chief Economist and Strategist at Rosenberg Research and Associates, Inc., an economic consulting firm he established in January 2020. He and his team have as their top priority providing investors with analysis and insight to help them make well-informed investment decisions. Mr. Rosenberg received both a Bachelor of Arts and Master's of Arts degree in economics from the University of Toronto. Prior to Rosenberg research, David was Chief Economist and Strategist at Gluskin Chef & Associates from 2009 to 2019. From 2002 to 2009, he was Chief North American Economist at Merrill Lynch in New York, during which he was consistently ranked in the Institutional Investor All-Star Analyst rankings. Prior thereto, he was Chief Economist and Strategist for Merrill Lynch Canada based out of Toronto, where he and his team placed first in the Brennan Woods Survey of Canadian Economists for 10 years in a row. As a special treat for everyone on tonight's webinar, David has graciously offered a complimentary one-month trial to his research service. You can access this, plus downloads of tonight's presentation slides and a webinar replay after the event. Here's how to get all of that. Tomorrow morning, look for an email from us. It'll contain a survey to let you know how, let us know rather, how you enjoyed tonight's presentation. And once you complete that survey, you'll get access to all of the above. And if you appreciate all the work that we put into Investor's Guide to Thriving, all we ask in return is that you continue consider joining Larry and I to support childhood leukemia research at Sick Kids Oncology and the world leading research being done by the Baycrest Foundation into the treatment of Alzheimer's and dementia. If you'd like to make a donation, please use the links in the survey you'll receive after the event, as that's how we track which donations to match. If you've already made a donation, thank you very, very much. Thank you also to our sponsors, National Bank, Direct Brokerage, and BMO ETFs. BMO ETFs has been our partner in ETF education for over 10 years, which is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to ETF wisdom of our first speaker this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always an honor to introduce our good friend, Mr. Mark Webster from BMO ETFs. Thank you very much, Jared. And uh, th thank you, uh, Larry and David, for giving me some time on your uh, presentation this evening. The, the topic this evening is um, ESG, uh, Environment, Society and Governance Investing, and, and how uh, Canadians can properly allocate their, their capital to do the, the most good. But this has been a very divisive topic. It's highly polarizing. And I have to say, it's probably also greatly misunderstood, probably because of its polarization. On the one hand, you have people who, who say we should forego mangoes, bananas, oranges, uh, they're unethical, uh, they want to change our behavior enormously. And on the others, you have uh, uh, people who say there's no climate crisis at all. And the truth, as usual, normally lies right in the middle. Just as an example, Saskatchewan is now able to grow corn on a commercial basis uh, because their growing season has actually lengthened over the last number of years. Canada will be a beneficiary um, as we see some of these changes come to us over the coming decades. But you can see some of the myths that have emerged in this discussion. Um, isn't responsible investing uh, and ethical investing the same thing? And the answer is no. It's a passing trend. Uh, that may or may not be so. Uh, this pandemic is going to uh, cause some difficulties for uh, ethical asset allocation in the future. Um, but the biggest thing that seems to be on people's minds is if I decide that I want to have responsible investing overlay on my money, do I have to give up sources of return? And the answer, fortunately, for that also is no. Um, if we flip to the next page, um, get into a little bit of a discussion over what is responsible investment. 
Responsible investment actually emerged in the 1920s with face-based organizations, uh, developed even stronger in the 1930s during the Depression, where people were very concerned about whether companies were being good corporate citizens. So ostensibly, responsible investing has evolved to become something that we refer to as ESG, environmental, social, uh, and governance. So the E part we all very well understand. In this present virus pandemic, the social and the governance are actually gaining enormously in people's consideration. This is becoming far more a lightning rod for the things that people question. Uh, we've seen um, uh, layoffs in, in different sectors or industries or companies, concerns about human rights where people are being put back into uh, factories, uh, even though there are questions about their health and safety. In some instances, there have been governance concerns because of the way uh, executives continue to be paid, even while their companies are getting um, uh, 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 bonuses, uh, pardon me, uh, uh, bailouts from, go from governments and so on. So there's a whole notion that companies have to be better corporate citizens and it better people who are better corporate citizens uh, will lead to better returns or enhanced returns lower down. So why ESG? Why not something else? If you look at um, why ESG, and I'll get into that in the next slide, but if you look at these four incidences, um, note that TEPCO is the famous uh, Fukushima uh, meltdown a few years ago in Japan. You see the, 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 the drop in, in TEPCO shares there. That is an environmental disaster. So that fully qualifies under the E, and that's the part that's got a lot more scrutiny or, or following over the last number of years. Valiant and Volkswagen are both corporate malfeasance, so they're not E's. Equifax might even fall in. These are governance issues. So you see the impact of Valiant at one time rivaled Royal Bank to be the largest stock in the, Can in the Canadian market. And it's had a remarkable fall from grace since 2015. If we go back 30 years, the Exxon Valdez spilled uh, off, uh, off the Alaskan coast and there was barely a ripple. But look at how, how much of an impact these things have today. And look at, if you look at these charts, you can see how little those stocks have recovered from their lofty highs. This has a very important impact on your uh, on, on on the exposure in your portfolios. So the, the other reason why ESG um, high ESG companies generally have a lower cost of capital and also display a slightly lower beta. There's a very sound investment reason to look at companies with high ESG rankings. You see that it's becoming more and more part of the way Canadians look at how they're allocating their capital. In the United States, Deloitte, the consulting firm, has found that 50% of US assets in the next five years are going to be managed with some form of responsible investing overlay. Just goes to show you the degree to which this is no longer uh, a flash in the pan or, 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 or a marketing gimmick. This is becoming the foundation of the way people are incorporating it into their investment process. So, we have associated ourselves with MSCI because we wanted people who were good at two things. One of them was ranking companies by their ESG score. So looking at, uh, at all the elements that make one company different from another, but also somebody who was very good at creating an index. It's one thing to say you can screen for ESG. It's another thing to say you can build an investment exposure. MSCI is good at both. The reason we chose them is that ESG, unlike um, ethical investing or forms of responsible investing, is actually a fiduciary concept. So if you're running a pension plan or an endowment, you are a fiduciary and you can't accept too much tracking error. So this approach that ES, the ESG leaders index uses um, does not exclude industries or sectors. Um, and the reason it doesn't do that, it doesn't do that because it's fairly impractical. If you exclude, you are going to end up with vicarious exposure through insurers, through banks, 
uh, through other through other areas. If you look at energy as an example, if you buy a pipeline, if you buy a railway, if you buy a steel producer, they're going to have vicarious exposure to energy. So it's impractical. Uh, it's not an effective way to do things. And as, as you can see by this um, slide, if you don't own, you cannot vote. And if you don't vote, you don't have any influence. So it's not only a question of what you own, it's also a question of how do you act. And that's how you become an impact investor. And as you can see, Bank of Montreal um, certainly leads the industry enormously as an active shareholder. Um, it's a very important consideration, we have voted against management in 26% of the, the cases. And that makes us a far more active shareholder, not only what we hold, but when we hold something, we exert a positive influence for change over time. So if you want to implement this in your portfolios, Larry, can you maybe switch to the next slide? Um, we've got, got a complete suite, so you can pick exposures for the US, for Canada, for global, you can do it in fixed income as well. The simplest solution for most people implementing a portfolio would be a global balanced ESG ETF, which is ZESG. So it's a 60-40 balanced mandate um, that stocks, bonds, uh, Canada, US, international, uh, emerging markets, very comprehensive. And you can see for a very, um, very low fee, easy to slot into your portfolio. For people who are big fans of our covered calls, we've created ZWG, which is a global dividend uh, covered call, selected from these ESG uh, indices that we use for Canada, US, uh, international, and so on. So you can actually find the same sustainable dividend growers methodology with the covered call uh, additional income, um, tax effective, but still with a responsible investing overlay. So these are these are your first steps in looking at ESG and incorporating it as part of your investment process. I'd recommend that yeah, but we look at our BMO ETF dashboard, full of tools, great explanation on ESG. Uh, there are comparison tools that you can use to compare one ETF to another. Uh, this is a great compendium of information of all kinds for those of you who are doing your own investing. Now, I'd like to turn it over to, to Larry and to uh, David Rosenberg for the rest of the presentation. Thank you very much for having me on. Thanks very much, uh, Mark. Uh, we'll try to get David on here, if we can uh, get your webinar and your uh, volume going, David. I, I'm really excited. I, I first met David going back. It's got to be close to 25 years now. Um, I was working at Burns Fry at the time in the early 90s as an analyst and moved to the States for a couple of years. And when I came back in the later um, part of the 1990s, uh, David was moving up in his career and, and later uh, took the role at Merrill Lynch, as, as Jared introduced in his, um, uh, in his opening um, remarks. Uh, I used to get David's notes sometimes across my desk and and uh, David and I, if you didn't know already by the uh, moniker of today's uh, presentation, uh, we th we're, we're risk managers. It, 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 we, you know, we look at the, the downside uh, often before we look at the upside potential. But uh, as we scope out the discussion tonight that we've uh, nicknamed shooting the bull, um, we're going to talk about a lot of different topics, and, and I think it's going to be, be very, very exciting. But I often get branded a bear. I know David uh, sometimes likes it. I, th I think he's more of a teddy bear than a, uh, than a market bear. But uh, because we look at the risk management side, we often get painted in this uh, crowd. But it, it's not a bad place to be, actually, because... You know, for for me, I, I talk about delivering sleep at night portfolios, and and it's about managing risk. And uh, so for a bear, I'm actually one of the best ones out there because, as, as Mark often said, when I'm on the road with him talking about BMO ETFs, uh, you know, Larry's been driving for years now with his foot on the brake <laughs> because he hasn't liked uh, the economy and and uh, different things like that. So. So let, let's get into the, uh, the presentation. I've got David on here. Everyone can see David, a little wave to the crowd there. All right, we got him going. 
terrific. So the agenda today, David and I are going to riff for half an hour, 40 minutes on, on what's going on in the world, a lot of different topics. We're going to look at David's bullish buy list on, there's always something to buy. A famous TV guy once said, there's a bull market somewhere. I'm trying to find it for you. So, uh, and then we'll take some live Q and A and as we go through the whole presentation. One of the things, David, I've been reading you for years and years and years, and you talk about this Potemkin uh, economy we're in, and it's, it's, you know, it's not real. Can, can you enlighten us to what what you what you mean by you know slapping lipstick on a pig? <laughs> well, I think we're going to get into um, uh, a lot of the subset uh, of that hypothesis, uh, which is basically this: uh, this was uh, yet another cycle, uh, the third one in the past three decades uh, that was dominated by asset inflation and debt accumulation. Um, you know, we had this, of course, uh, heading into the uh, LBO and savings and loan crisis and commercial real estate in the early 90s. Uh, we had it with the dot-coms and the tech wreck. Uh, then several years later, of course, we have the uh, situation with housing finance and uh, mortgages. Uh, and then, of course, uh, this past cycle with corporate debt. The The point I'm making is that once again, we have a cycle where we just poured leverage on top of leverage, no capital investment, weakest cycle for productivity. I wrote a report today, it's going to go in my uh, Breakfast with Dave tomorrow, showing that heading into this crisis, uh, U.S. industrial production was no higher today than it was 20 years ago. What does the economy produce? Not much. It produces cyclical services, uh, entertainment, leisure, hospitality, nothing that's really productivity driven. And so, I think so wait a second, wait a second. It, this isn't the best economy ever because we, we keep hearing that this is the best economy ever. Well, um, you know, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a cycle driven. Look, it's incredible. And look, we're going to talk more about this. Look what has been shut down in this pandemic in this lockdown what's been shot what's been shut down larry what's been shut down is what, what they call what the non-essential non economy we're going to leave the essential stuff open but we're going to close the non-essential and the non-essential is like 80 percent of gdp that's what the united states has become the non-essential economy it's a little interesting right that all the people we laid off and of course there'll be social dynamics from this as to how this affected the little guy as opposed to wall street but look at all the people that have been laid off yeah I haven't so been laid off. you haven't been laid off but everybody that works in these low value added low skilled uh the burger flipper the barmaid the bell captain the the killer bees they're the ones that have been laid off in the cycle because that's what the economy has really become so it's it's I, I've said for many years it's a fragile economy and and earnings aren't growing so so that's the whole idea Th this reminds me of a movie I saw and I can't remember the name of it but there was this small town and they needed some kind of business loan and they had like 25 people in the town and they took this bank guy from one store to the next and they all ran out the back door and then into the next store and then they all ran out the back door and into the next door and they were building this Potemkin village right that like it, it was a facade and that's kind of what all this credit expansion has been you know over the last 10 years it's we, we can create economic growth at the expense of the balance sheet right and i think that just for people that well you can just google this <laughs> the internet's amazing uh but uh, gregor potemkin was the general uh for Catherine the great uh four centuries ago that built uh these fake villages when she visited uh, to make her feel like that she was accomplishing something. These were fake villages. She only saw the facade. And that's really what, and this is, look, this is not the first time, Larry, that we've had a cycle that was really built, uh, a, a castle built on sand. That's really what it is. Leverage on top of leverage. And that's the one thing that we have to really assess here. Look, there's a lot of things that we don't know. You know, if there's a vaccine in the next three, six, nine, 12 months, well, that's a game changer. But the one thing that we know with a fact right here, right now, is that a health crisis morphed into an economic crisis. Who was sitting here talking about the economic crisis morphing in 
to a financial crisis, not a financial crisis, a financial crisis 10 times bigger than 08 and 09 when Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, AIG all went down for the count. And it's because of the gigantic amount of leverage in the system and the fact that nobody had any liquidity, whether you're a portfolio manager, a company, or a household. You had no cash. We had a lot of debt. Yeah, there was no reason this ever had to be such a crisis, <laughs> except for the fact that we were totally unprepared from a financial standpoint, let alone a health standpoint, that we were totally unprepared that the Fed has to come in to backstop the junk bond market. Okay, let, let's go on. To, yeah, let, let's go on to the next topic because you 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 said something uh, there that that you know got me curious here, and and you you basically said that we had underinvestment. There a lot of the uh, profits, if you not all of them are real, but a lot of the profits were not reinvested into capital, like business investment has been weak, and and that's created a bifurcated market. Uh, the front page of The Economist magazine this week uh, calls it the 90% economy when we come back. But but inequality is something you've talked about recently. I've talked about it for a number of years. You've got a couple metrics here. One's, um, uh, both these charts have come out of your, your research notes. Um, the Gini coefficient, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. But but this top, this chart in the top right corner, um, the, the labor share of income, what, what do these things mean? It means that, you know, we had a, an, a society, and look, th these numbers are not nearly as bad in Canada, uh, but Canada doesn't drive the bus when it comes to the global economy. We're talking about still the dominant force globally, and it's basically, and look, uh, I consider myself to be a capitalist, uh, but I am not a Larry Kudlow unbridled free market capitalist. And this is basically free market capitalism gone unchecked. And there's going to be a price to be paid, especially now that we know who's getting hit the most is the low wage, low value added, low service sector worker. So what these charts show, and primarily through how the resources, the fiscal resources in the United States are being transferred over time. I mean, look, uh, Donald Trump comes in and does supposedly tax reform in uh, 2018. Now the US needed corporate tax reform, but you see what he did was that he dramatically lowered corporate tax rates. There was no broadening of the base. At the same time, what does he do? He lowers marginal tax rates for the personal sector across the board. Of course, when you do across the board tax cuts, which a libertarian would say, well, that's all fine, but you widen the gulf between the haves and the have nots. And so what's happened here over time, it's been exacerbated. Look, it was exacerbated during the Obama administration, further compounded during the Trump administration. The Gini coefficient really is just an economic measure of income disparity, the gap between the highest and the lowest, the highest quintile, lowest quintile. And it is not a social equilibrium. Uh, the other chart on the top is the capital labor ratio. The returns, of course, went to capital as opposed to labor. It was still rather incredible to me that uh, with a three and a half percent unemployment rate up until February, there wasn't much in the way of wage growth in the United States for a whole host of reasons. Uh, part of it, of course, is where is the orientation of the U.S. economy going? It's really increasingly going towards low value added, low wage industries. Uh, and that's really why overall income growth remains so weak for so long. There is never much of an orientation back to the high value added, high productivity, high service and goods related capital sectors that you had in the 80s and 90s. So what this all shows is a, an economy and a society that went into this, this crisis, very lopsided uh, and imbalanced. Uh, yeah. And these two charts also come to the heart of the leverage in the system. The leverage in the system and the leverage in the system benefited the high end expense of the low end. As I said before, the third cycle in a row of dramatic debt expansion. But the debt expansion ultimately gravitates to those people that actually have the credit score to get the credit. Yeah, the, bo uh, the so bottom that's, half that's is... 
Sorry? The bottom half isn't benefiting. Like when, when, when all the policies we have are designed to boost the stock market and that becomes the measure of success and the bottom half have none of that or very little of that. It, it, yeah, it, it's our, our good friend Pierre Polyev uh, uses a phrase, the, the have nots and the have yachts. <laughs> you know, uh, to explain, you know, what this is all about. And, and so, so how do we fix this? Minimum wages have to go up, unions get stronger. How, how does this uh, balance out? Because the last time it was this bad, if I'm not mistaken, was the late 1920s. And it was the wealth destruction in the 1930s that balanced it out. And ultimately the war that put the bottom half back to work uh, that created that the next boom cycle. So, so how do how does this end? Well, how does this? How do we come out of this and and fix this problem? Well, I mean, we're going through uh, what a lot of people are saying right now is a depression, uh, not a recession. And a recession is a classic business cycle decline in GDP, and within a year after it ends, nobody's talking about it. A depression is different uh, in that it invokes a secular change. In behavior uh, and they don't come around too often uh, you know people tend to forget as you said we went into the 1930s with very similar income disparities what happened in the 1930s was the advent of uh, of, of, of labor unions uh, so there was worker protection uh, you know that went away after the uh, Reagan revolution uh, in the 1980s a lot of things are going to be changing uh, and I think a lot of this let's face it is uh, uh, is how the tax system uh, is built. And, and again, you know, uh, I mean, I love Ronald Reagan, don't get me wrong, I thought he was great, but uh, I think his fiscal policy um, uh, went overboard. Uh, and that uh, what happened was that the tax reform of the 1980s uh, ended up skewing after tax income uh, into the higher end as opposed to the lower end. Uh, if you remember how we paid for the Great Depression, this is before World War II. Uh, was top marginal tax rates, you know, went up from 25% all the way up to 80%. And ultimately, they got above 90% to fight World War II. Uh, but a lot of this is really a distorted tax system, I'd have to say, that has continued to favor high-income individuals. At the same time, on the wealth side, <laughs> that the stock market ended up benefiting the same sort of people. And that's how we get these extreme uh, inequalities and look yeah. we're not going to solve inequalities we're, we're, these, charts we're, we're, tell, these charts are telling you that you know we're heading into three or four standard deviation events we're heading into extremes where uh you almost want to tell people taking uh, their cfa courses to add on um a, a chapter on history uh because these because you see what's important here in putting on your history hat understanding uh, that, uh, you know, these emotions of fear and greed, uh, you know, technology doesn't change those, uh, those uh, severe emotions. And so I think that the one thing that we want to pay attention to is that capitalism and democracy dance on a pin together. It is a very tenuous relationship, and it's going to be put to the test, I think, in the next 12 to 24 months. Certainly, and these things are, of course, measured in decades. So, so our next topic um, takes us to, you know, the natural rate of growth, um, and and demographics have a lot to to do with this. There's a a couple charts here that I've cobbled together. Um, we've got the one on the left here uh, is from uh, StatsCan, and it's basically showing. Um, percentage of population, working age versus non-working age. And, and ultimately what that leads to is the, what they call the dependency ratio. So, right, so the, the amount of people uh, not contributing by way of taxes, so 15 and under, and of course 65 and older in terms of they're not working anymore. Uh, and so while they still pay taxes, it's not as much as when they were earning income necessarily. And that dependency ratio is gonna get worse and worse and worse. So you take that and then you have this table here um, on the far right side of the chart and it's showing the birth rates and the birth rates have been in declining, declining, declining and globally still two and a half percent. So we're getting 
growth on a global basis being two people get together, they have a higher rate than two and therefore there's natural growth. But in North America and most of the developed world, that number is well below two. So you've got parts of the world that are growing, but ultimately you, you have uh, lower um, a natural rate of growth. And then you have labor productivity. And again, it goes to the lack of business investment in productive capacity and using those dollars to buy back shares, for example, in the last decade. So you have a great table here. Again, I clipped it from one of your recent notes. Um, and it, it basically shows the aggregate supply and demand, you know, post-World War II, um, what the 80s were like, you highlighted and in your note, you were commenting on the last decade and how significantly lower that output was and, and demand was. So can you talk about all these factors in terms of what, what's that natural rate of growth and we're, we're just got to get used to a slower growing world? Well, well look, I think that uh, if we're talking about the future, uh, let's make no mistake, uh, there's there's no profits and there's not going to be any capital growth, capital spending growth for the next few years, which means no productivity. Uh, and we're going to have millions of people out of work that will not be able to find a job. Some people will come back. We're reopening the economy gradually. I saw a survey that uh, half of the U.S. business sector uh, is going to fail in the next six months. This is the leg that we haven't seen yet. We've seen the horrific data. On the employment side, we haven't seen the data on business bankruptcies, small businesses. Uh, that means we're going to have impairment of uh, 13 million people. Uh, we're going to get a number tomorrow, non-farm payrolls, probably going to be down 20 million. Uh, there's going to be a significant number of those that don't come back. So it means the labor force participation rate is going to be coming down over time. Productivity rate is going to be coming down over time. And those are your two components of potential growth or aggregate supply, I think that they're going to be a fraction of 1%. The supply side of the economy, and that actually comes down to that table uh, that you presented, um, which is a lot of numbers. That's why I really uh, boxed in what's really important. What's really important is the, is, the, is the bottom box, because we always talk about the economy in GDP terms. Everybody looks at the economy GDP, average annual GDP, GDP this, GDP that, because GDP comes out every quarter and the markets trade off at its front page news, and GDP is all about spending. And because we're all a bunch of narcissists, that's all we like to talk about is spending, but that's what GDP is. GDP is aggregate demand. So what's interesting is that this cycle, aggregate demand, which is on the far right, averaged 2.1% at an average annual rate. So I know we were kibitzing before about the greatest economy of all time. <laughs> And despite all the efforts by the Fed to generate an equity wealth effect on spending and all the efforts by the uh, administration to goose fiscal policy to get people to spend, and maybe part of this is demographic as well, but you could see that aggregate demand was 2.1% in annual rate, despite all the king's horses and all the king's men in that 11-year bull market expansion, aggregate demand 2.1%, the weakest of all time. But the question then becomes, if we had the weakest demand of all time, how come we didn't get the deflation? Now, the Fed will tell you, oh, well, inflation's too low for us. It's, it's below 2%. You see, I look at it the other way. How is it with the weakest demand of all time, we never slipped into even a mild deflationary experience? That's the real question, not that inflation is uncomfortably low for a central bank with a 2% inflation target the question is with such weak demand because i'll tell you right now if we had the aggregate supply growth of the 80s and 90s when we had real productivity that supply side growth would have generated a deflationary environment in the context of the demand side of the economy in the past 11 years you see you can't forecast prices with one curve you can't do it just with demand anything you ever forecast whether it's real estate whether it's commodities, whether it's uh, consumer goods, you need to have two curves, aggregate supply and aggregate demand. So the point I'm making here is that look at the aggregate supply. Because of productivity and demographics, 1.7% per year. It was The aggregate supply curve was even weaker than demand. And that's why you never slipped into 
even lower inflation than what we had. And that's actually what's going to happen in the future is once demand stabilizes, the supply side of the economy is going to be so sclerotic, we're going back into a stagflationary environment in the next three to five years. And it's not too early to be thinking about that, stagflation, a word yeah, we haven't we'll, seen in 40 years. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well, for sure. But uh, so you have this natural rate of growth. So all this excess growth that we talk about, it, it's it's been you know largely fueled by credit expansion. I mean, the amount of debt in the world has has literally doubled. Um, so, so you, here's a, here's your chart on on uh, capital investment falling off a cliff, and, and uh, but in a recent research report, I, I love your stuff, Dave. I, I always said, Dave, he's, you're the best forensic economist on the planet because you really you, you look at the meat, you look at the blind spot. Most people just they they kind of see that number. Oh, it's a good number. They don't realize what makes up the number, and a lot of that growth, and whether it's been China. Um, uh, U.S., Europe, I mean, the amount of credit expansion has been uh, quite something. But this shock and the that the world's not ready for, you came out with three scenarios, a moderate, your base case, a best case, and a worst case, um, as to when this output gap closes. Can you talk a little bit about what an out ga output gap is and, and its influence on inflation and deflation? Yeah, well, it flows exactly from the um, from the table we just talked about, as I put on my economics professor hat. Uh, but you always want to take a look at the interaction between aggregate supply and aggregate demand. The interaction between productivity and labor force on one side and spending on the other side. And so these charts here show you that at least heading into 2022, uh, even under the most robust uh, growth assumptions, we're still going to be left with an output gap, which tells you that the pressures on pricing is going to be more negative than positive. I know that you'll say, well, didn't you just talk about stagflation three minutes ago? But I said that's basically if you have a three to five year view. This is telling you, at least over the near term, these output gap charts are telling you that we're going to be suffering with excess supply in the not just the US and Canadian economy, but globally. And that's going to put downward pressure on inflation at these very low levels and act as a ongoing source of uh, compression on profit margins which of course is not something that the stock market is looking at right now the stock market is breathing the fumes of, uh, of fed liquidity um, but this is telling you that the underlying fundamentals for corporate pricing power and for inflation are going to remain dormant for a very long period of time i was listening to a conference call about a year ago as an earnings call for jp morgan and uh, Jamie Dimon had come on and he said, we, we think the 10-year yield is going to normalize around 5%. And I fell off my chair laughing. I said, the, the, the guys running the biggest bank in the world doesn't have a clue about what the world is, how fragile the world is. Uh, in the, the chart of the upper right corner here is the, is the 10-year interest rate chart going back to the early 60s. Um, are we going to see negative Fed policy? Like, what can they do to stimulate here? What What is the right policy mix? Well, look, the um, the Fed is uh, really pushing the envelope, uh, but its powers are really limited towards being a lender. Remember, the Fed is the lender of last resort. Well, now it's the lender of last resort, first resort, and everything in between. But what we've had What's the what's the Fed going to do? Is the Fed so the Fed is going to, at its best, provide liquidity to the marketplace, ensure the better functioning of the marketplace. The Fed's not equipped to deal with solvency issues. The Fed is not equipped to deal with income issues. That's a fiscal policy. Um, so the Fed, look, Powell's already told you we've done a lot. We're going to do more. Uh, will the Fed come in and buy equities? I somehow doubt it. I think there's gotta be a limit at some point as to how you're going to move towards uh, distorting uh, capital allocation uh, and taking risk out of the marketplace altogether, in which case we can just kiss capitalism goodbye uh, indefinitely. So this is not a Fed issue, uh, but I think at some point, it's not just about fiscal stimulus, because right now all they're really doing is they're filling holes uh, there, it's almost like a, a bridge gap 
uh, not necessarily financing uh, for the household sector. It's an actual income transfer. We told you to stay home and we're going to pay you so that we can limit social instability because you can imagine if they didn't. And to the business sector, they're saying, well, look, here's money to keep your operations open. Don't fire anybody. And we'll treat it as a grant instead of a loan when all is said and done. The, the question really is, can they bail everybody out? Um, and the answer is no. The answer is that they can't bail everybody out. And then when the push comes to shove, whether it's Canada or the United States, how are we going to end up paying for this? And we're going to pay for it through higher taxes. And the higher yeah, well, taxes will be on, on, people, on people like me well, and you. Well, yeah, so we'll get to that. I wanted to just do a, a recommendation here. And I've talked in the last few weeks of our webinars about this being one of my favorite ETFs. Uh, David, this is ZPay, and it's an ETF that writes puts on great companies that you would want to own at lower levels and generates yields. When the markets fall to those levels, you end up being long the stocks. And then they write calls on the same stocks at the levels they want to sell them at, and they're generating 5 6% yield. So if we're for the next few years in an environment where the economy is just not going to bounce back in a robust way, for the yield seekers out there, this is not without risk, but it's going to generate that 5 6% that the average retiree would like to earn but with a lot less uh, sensitivity to the ups and downs. So, you know, I've put the uh, uh, this recommendation out there. It is one of the biggest positions in, in my sleep at night portfolios. Uh, let's get into the largest and, and who's gonna pay for this. You must know who Stephanie Kelton is. She's She haunts me. She, she's, she's the um, uh, big advocate out there for modern monetary theory and and basically turning on the taps and printing money to pay for everything. The article in, in The Economist uh, this week, can we afford to pay for this debt? Who's going to pay for it? I got the answer. It was in the uh, Declaration of Independence. We the people, <laughs> we the people are going to pay for this. This quarter, David, uh, you've, I know you know these numbers, but the U.S. Treasury has to borrow $3 trillion, the total sum of what they've borrowed in the last four years put into one quarter. How do we do this? Because she, she if, if, if uh, this is AOC, if Congress is still controlled, they, they want to spend even more. They're talking about Pelosi. I, I heard talked about universal basic income as part of the next package even. Well, look, there's going to be a uh, a variety of sources uh, that will finance that. I mean, they're they're in a period like now, and you're seeing it in the relative strength of the U.S. dollar. There is demand for dollars. There is demand for liquidity, and you're going to find big institutions, uh, the big insurance companies, pension funds, uh, will step in and, and buy uh, this debt. Especially keeping in mind that you know even at 0.6% on the U.S. 10-year Treasury note. It's still about the highest, the highest in the world. It's like the U.S. Treasury market is the smartest kid at summer school. But make no mistake, um, a lot of this is going on the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, Larry, we've already, we've already seen in the past six weeks, the Fed's balance sheet has expanded by uh, 2.2 trillion dollars. You know, the Fed's already done, and the, the, the Fed's done uh, in, a, in in a couple of months what it took them two years to achieve during the financial crisis of over a decade ago. And uh, nobody seems to mind. There's no controversy this time. Uh, so uh, a lot of this is going to end up on the Fed's balance sheet. Powell already told you at last week's uh, testimony at his press conference that the Fed's balance sheet is infinite uh, and that they will continue to step in. And treasuries are easy because they're so liquid. Uh, they're not going to lose money on this on these investments. They'll hold on to them to maturity. Um, but the Fed's balance sheet will be the backstop here. Uh, but but if, Trump, if Trump wants a Trump wants a tax cut in the next bill. Like like he, <laughs> you know, obviously he's politicking. But uh, taxes are going to go up. This is part of the stag longer term stagflation story, is it not? Like he wants a yeah he wants a payroll tax cut. Of course, payroll taxes fund social security, and we're going to have lots of uh, uncertainty for uh, baby boomers that are now heading into the retirement years. Uh, that um, are going to be forced to question the veracity of their uh, underfunded uh, public sector pension funds as it is at the state and local level. Uh, so no, there's there's no tax cuts coming. There are absolutely no chance. And in fact, 
you know, when you look at the polls right now, and I know, look, fake polls, this is what the polls showed in 2016, uh, but it's rather incredible that Joe Biden with his own baggage is uh, so far ahead in the polls right now. Uh, I mean, Donald Trump, I wasn't saying this a couple of months ago, I think he's vulnerable. Uh, there's no better campaigner, don't get me wrong, and he's excellent at the blame game. Uh, but Biden's got a serious chance, and I'll tell you right now, you have to start thinking about what if the Senate flips Democrat? So you have a Democratic clean sweep, and I'll tell you that we will be getting even more fiscal, and we'll be getting, and you'll be getting your uh, your magical money tree or your 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 uh, uh, modern monetary theory uh, very quickly if the cool. Democrats were to win. But that I think that's in our future. First question from one of our viewers that uh, wrote in, by printing an unlimited amount of money, can the Fed create an endless bull market in stock? Should we all just be bulls and ignore the damaged economy? So we've got a couple pictures here. I've got uh, the G4 central bank balance sheet, or the BS as I like to call it, as a percentage of the GDP of those four countries. So we've got the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, and the Bank of England. Collectively, the size of their balance sheet, 44% of their GDP. And in the inset, I clipped a, a one from your uh, report, I think just the other day, where we've got the size of the Fed balance sheet now at around 6.6 .6 trillion. Um, and as we know, the, the economy is gonna take a 10% hit. It's roughly, what, 18, trillion then if we see a 10 percent hit so you're talking like the fed balance sheet's about 35 percent of of gdp at the moment um and so the fed's a big part of this uh, and this is only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger uh, at the same time corporate balance sheets have have never been worse in in terms of our exposure so what kind of deleveraging cycle are we going to get and how much of this, does the Fed going to have to buy? Is is, is there because Powell said there was no limit? Is is there really no limit? Well, theoretically, uh, there is no limit, and uh, the it's the Fed's not the only game in town. You got, I mean, in Canada, we used to, we were boasted of how well we were one of the, we didn't have to do quantitative easing back in 08 and 09. We bragged about it, and now uh, we're doing our own QE. Australia's doing its QE. Uh, you got New Zealand doing its QE. Uh, you got the Korean government is handing out spending vouchers uh, to its citizenry. Uh, and actually, the first central bank to undergo outright debt monetization, which is when the central bank doesn't just go buy the bonds in the secondary market, they buy it right from the treasury. Well, by the way, the Bank of England historically, don't forget, <laughs> they've been around for like a thousand years. The BOE is a leading indicator. Uh, so uh, the answer is, uh, yeah, I think that the central banks uh, you know, are going to continue to do what they do until they are convinced we're into some self-sustaining economic recovery, which is next to impossible right now to predict because it's not as if a prediction of recovery is, is hinged on some classic business cycle data point. It's gonna hinge on a vaccine, uh, and if not a vaccine, then some effective treatment. And uh, I imagine a treatment will come, but who knows when, and a vaccine, hopefully, but again, further down the line. So the central banks have already, you see, it's beautiful. The central banks, and this is not a time to be a Puritan, this is not a time to take out your old Immanuel Kant and Calvin books about ethics. You've got a casino called the stock market, and you got a blackjack dealer called the central bank. So you can say, uh, I wanna go buy the equity market. You know, they've been in this game a long time. They've been in this game a long time. I mean, what happens now is because the market's bounced off the lows, everybody is trying to fit the narrative to the price action without even realizing that in the past 12 months, would you want it to be in the equity market, gold, or 30 year treasuries? Well, I can tell you, out of the three asset classes, gold and long bonds have smoked the equity market. In fact, the Wilshire 5000 total return index, 5000 stocks, okay, we're not talking about the Dow 30. The total return index is no higher today than it was in January 
of 2018. That was 30 months ago. So uh, the answer is that there's parts of the stock market, I'm sure we'll get to, Larry, parts of the market. I, I say to people, create your own index. You don't have to go by the market where 70% of the market you probably just don't want to own, but maybe 30% you do. So uh, what I'm saying is that, no, I don't really buy into the narrative. I got to buy stocks. I'll tell you right now, if if the Fed is there to backstop the stock market, they're going to backstop every single market. So I would say, you know, if they're going to backstop equities, buy what's residing next door in the capital structure, where if things go awry, you see in a bankruptcy, your equity is wiped out. But if they're going to backstop everything, I would just go and buy a high yield index. Why, why, why wouldn't you go buy a junk bond index and pick up a 7.5% coupon in a in, in a uh, 0% treasury bill environment? So uh, I'd say that risk for reward, if that's your view that the Fed's going to backstop everything out there, I'd as soon be in junk bonds than be in the S&P 500. Yeah, well, that's a good point. So a question here from Stephen Gill. I've read some conflicting reports re uh, regarding either coming inflationary or deflationary times ahead. We talked a little bit about that. What are your assessments of either occurring and what are the financial implications? So on our next slide here, here's the deflation to stagflation story. Um, you know, supply chains, it, it's uh, money supply, like l let's let's scope this out. So the next couple of years, lots of deflation, but ultimately the coming inflation. You know, President Trump talked about bringing the, job, the good jobs back. That's expensive. The, we pay more for labor in, in our economy than, than we do in some other places in the world. But that 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 putting up walls, you know, around the world, this is going to get expensive at some point. Not to mention higher taxes and so forth. I the way I see it, the only outcome is stagflation, and that's not good for stocks or bonds. So, so what do you think about that? Well, look, you know, I, I can understand, uh, you know, the uh, the the confusion by the person who asked the question because uh, even I had mentioned both deflation and inflation in the same sentence and what i'm talking about is that we're eating a meal and uh, i'm talking about the appetizer uh, and then i'm talking about dessert so there's no question right now that what reacts first in this sort of situation is demand we have had a detonation in aggregate demand and so the initial shock is deflation and that could last one or two years maybe three and I said before that the aggregate supply curve moves glacially. What's going to happen is that at some point, we are going to have a recovery. You know, uh, you can call me bearish if you like. I don't think I'm bearish. I'm trying to be realistic. Guess what? The big bear says at some point, demand is going to stabilize. It might start next quarter. But you see, what's going to happen over time is that the supply curve is going to become more and more inflationary. We're going to reach a period where demand growth stabilizes at 1%, which is terrible, and that will be inflationary because the supply side growth will be close to zero, and that's how you get stagflation. You have weak growth in supply, weak growth in demand, but you see over time what happens is that the growth in demand, as anemic as it is, is stronger than the growth rate of supply, and that's exactly what Larry's talking about. We're talking here about the impairment of global supply chains, the partial reversal of globalization, which had dramatic dramatic reduction in business costs globally, that at the margin is going to start to go away. You, when you relocalize production chains domestically, it's more costly because you just go back to classic David Ricardo, Adam Smith economics and the theory of comparative advantage, we're no longer going to be sourcing production, especially in areas like healthcare, semiconductors, uh, and uh, foodstuffs. We're going to start sourcing that domestically. That's going to mean higher costs. We came into this situation with the business sector uh, tight for inventory because just-in-time inventories meant I didn't have to have inventory. And I don't have to finance inventory. Well, that's going to change now. You're going to want to have some stockpiles on hand ahead of the next disaster whenever that happens. Well, that's going to be costlier. And we're going to have a situation, as I said before, where the natural rate of unemployment, which everybody thought was maybe 4%, 
is now going to be like 8%. It's going to be a little bit like the 1970s, except we're not going to be wearing bell bottoms and listen to disco music. But you see, all of these things impair the supply side of the economy. In other words, what it means is it leads to a higher business cost structure. And don't forget that on top of that is productivity. We're going to go into a productivity, as I said before, was already weak because the bull market was in financial engineering. The bull market was borrow money and buy back stock, not go into capital investment, weakest capital investment of all time. It's going to be even weaker. So weak productivity growth inherently. On the supply side of the economy is cost push inflation. Everything and, leads to cost push inflation in the and, future. And if I put my CFA hat on, margins have never been better. Interest rates are low, labor costs are low, margins are going to get squeezed. Bottom line, and that that can't be good for uh, for net income either. Question here: um, What is both your short-term and long-term outlook on gold? Well, obviously, gold. I think we're both quite bullish on it. It's time to buy gold. If not now, when? I've been saying it for a few years now, when when it was a lot cheaper than it is today. But um, you know, what what do we think on gold, Robert asks. Uh, so I've got a couple charts here. One of them on the left side is actually. Uh, what gold is used for. So half of it over time tends to be jewelry demand. And as prices go up, we know jewelry demand gets squeezed a little bit. Um, then there's your demand for industrial or technology type demand, and then central banks and investment. So the question is, where is gold going? Because on a on a technical basis, I can draw these lines up here and I could project out a couple of years, 2,500-ish to me sounds sounds quite reasonable. If we take the base and we do some technical target expansion, we get an 1100 base and we add $1,700, 27, 2800. We saw Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, your old uh, stomping grounds come out with a 3000 gold target by the end of next year. What, what are you thinking on gold, Dave, other than you're bullish on it? Well, you know, again, Forgive me if I if I look at this from the lens uh, of an economist, because you know when you look at gold, how do you value it? I mean, you value equities. You can use a dividend discount model. Uh, you look at bonds. Look at the term premium. Uh, you look at corporate credit. You try and analyze default rates and recovery rates. So, what's the quotient or the equation for gold? Is really this. Uh, the stable production function. The fact that over years and years and decades and centuries, the annual growth in the net new supply of gold in any given year is between zero and 1%. That's why it has always been the standard. That's why when you talk about things that you like, things that you compare to, you always say, this is the gold standard. You know why? Because the production function is stable. That's why everything else is measured against it. And so when you see a situation today where US money supply growth is up 25%, and in Canada getting towards 20%, every part of the world, money printing, the money supply is accelerating dramatically. But the production of gold is going up between zero and 1%. Now, Look, there's going to be periods where, say, uh, when oil prices are weak, uh, the Russians have to sell gold to meet their debt service requirements. Uh, you probably have a situation in India, which is going through a horrific recession right now, where maybe the dowry season in terms of gold buying uh, isn't what it might have been a year ago. Be that as it may, what you have in gold is a stable supply curve at a time when paper money is being created around the world at a rate, by the way, that we didn't even see in the 1970s. And that's going to lead you in terms of relative supply to a price of gold that's going to surprise a lot of people. And it's not going to be a straight line. You know, we consolidated, had a basing pattern for six years, and then steady increases, steady increases, steady increases. You know, I, I love gold because my readership, people will say to me, how come gold didn't go up today? How come gold didn't go up today? Uh, what's wrong with gold? M meanwhile, it's been about the best asset class in the past 12 months and then the past several years. Everybody just focused on the equity market. Uh, but I will say this much. Gold is going to surprise a lot of people because think of what it's done 
in the past number of years in the deflationary environment because deflation is inherently destabilizing. And imagine then what it does when we get to the inflationary environment. The inflation part of the story is still several chapters ahead of us, and there's no better classic hedge against inflation, which is in, around the bend, than bullion, physical yeah. bullion. So, so, so here, it, it, what do you think of Bitcoin? I, I saw, I heard Paul Tudor Jones was establishing a position in Bitcoin. Is Bitcoin an electronic gold? I, I think it's worth nothing. I, it is an asset and it can be traded, but. But if you if you can't value gold, which which has jewelry, which which has lots of other things, to me, Bitcoin is is something that criminals use to to hijack <laughs> people, and and not much else. But what do you think of Bitcoin as a, an asset class? Well, you know, it's a uh, it, it's I mean, look, it's interesting. Uh, I don't own it. Maybe if I was uh, 22 years old with a few shekels, maybe I you know I, I'd be involved. Uh, it's a uh, still a bit of a mystery to me. I mean, I'm not talking about uh, the technology around it uh, and how it facilitates means of payment. Okay, I get that. As an asset class, though, as an asset class, uh, I'm not quite there. Uh, I would never. No, is it's not part of any recommendation. And I'll tell you right now, the question you have to ask yourself, especially if you're invested in equities, and, and equities are risky. There's no equity that is not risky, okay? Even your, if you think that utilities aren't risky, uh, well, every equity is risky and has volatility. Why do you want to introduce more volatility into your life? Now, I think a lot of that just will depend on how much of a risk taker you are uh, and maybe how old you are. Uh, maybe how much liquidity you have. Uh, would I ever recommend Bitcoin right now as an asset class? No, I like gold because I understand it. It's been around for thousands of years and uh, it's not volatile. Uh, I'm actually in a mode where I'm trying to convince people that listen to me. You, you know, in fact, isn't your title about sleeping at night? It is, uh, absolutely. Well, I, don't know, I don't know what Paul Tudor Jones would tell his clients, you know, because I don't know if you're going to sleep at night with a, an asset class that can go up or down 30% in a matter of a day. That's not something yeah. I want to recommend anybody. T Tudor Jones made his claim to fame in uh, calling the 1987 crash and apparently made $100 million that day getting the uh, whole scenario right. If you Google around out there, you'll you'll find a, a video on it. Um, but but it made the news today, so I thought I'd throw that in. It wasn't wasn't going to be one of the things we talked about. Let, let's turn to politics and geopolitics and and the split between the left and the right. Are, is is this China U.S. Uh, you know, COVID is the current thing, but it was a trade war before this. China wants to be the new U.S. They want to be the world leader. They want to be the reserve currency. Uh, she has no re-election risk, uh, and Trump does. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about the world and the scope of the in the global economy. Uh, the EU, I, I think Italy pulls out in a few years. They have a referendum, and the world's fragile to me. So let, let's talk a little bit about geopolitics, and you, you can start it off however you like. Well, I think that China is probably uh, uh, out of the two. Um, themes uh, between Italy and its dilapidated fiscal and banking system. Uh, I mean, look, we, we all thought, by the way, that, that Greece was going to be the country that brought uh, the Eurozone to its knees. And of course, Italy is a lot bigger and more important. Uh, but I, I think when push comes to shove, uh, the uh, even the Germans will realize that uh, uh, th that there would just be a, a incredible volatility and weakness and a depression if if they had that breakup, they, could, they can't afford to do it. So uh, I'm gonna, doesn't mean I wanna own Italy or own the Euro or own Europe, but that's not the big concern. China is the big concern. China was the big concern before the crisis. Now we have the blame game going on about uh, <laughs> what did they know and when did they know it um, and conspiracy theories. But even before then, uh, we were having trade wars and tariffs. And there's no doubt that China sees itself as a superpower but we were all talking about the Thucydides trap uh, before all this happened, which is we're in one of these rare situations globally where we have two 
global superpowers battling it out. And it's not battle on the battlefield, but it is battle in terms of commerce and economics uh, and trade. Uh, and uh, I do think that coming out of this crisis, uh, China is going to be penalized by uh, the rest of the world. Uh, I think that if there are reasons to uh, have been suspicious of China's intentions beforehand, and, and whether it's reality or it's perception, those perceptions are going to accelerate. Uh, so I think that global tensions uh, are going to be heightened for a longer period of time. Well, by the way, that's another reason why you own own gold, is that it's a hedge against these geopolitical uh, risks. Uh, so I think that it's not just now about China, whether it was with the Silk Road uh, or whether it was through its piracy issues uh, and its grabbing of a global market share of trade, uh, it's actually something a lot bigger now, which is which is trust. So um, there's a, a lot of issues uh, that are going to come to the fore, uh, and it's going to make relations, and not just between the U.S., but also the rest of the world, including Europe and China, very difficult. Uh, and so I think that there's a very good chance we're going to go back towards uh, these uh, trade escalations uh, that you know people are thinking that there's going to be a phase one that it's going to be cut in stone on a phase two I think we're going to go back towards a lot more tension and don't forget that the world now is incentivized to turn away from using China as an entrepot uh, for its manufacturing we're going to see a lot of facilities being pulled out and taken elsewhere that's going to have detrimental impacts on China how will they respond to that level of protectionism and let's just call it for what it is. When you're talking about with how the world's going to change now, whether or not we get a vaccine or treatment, how things are going to change is that this trend that was already developing, whether it was nationalism, populism, isolationism, protectionism. And I'd say, by the way, and I talked about the Democrats in November, the stock market won't like that, by the way, for people that are thinking that the Fed's going to save the day, uh, the trend is going to be towards socialism as well. Uh, and that's, by the way, what happens after economic depressions of what we're witnessing today. I uh, I got uh, quite active in politics about five years ago. And uh, for a lot of these reasons, I, I look around the world and I see a lot of extremism. I see votes going to, uh, listen, in Germany, they've got this extreme uh, alternative for Deutschland. They're, 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 they've now got seats in the Bundestag and and they're pulling 20, 25% in some of the regions. And the, the, these, a lot of the origins of the Nazi party, <laughs> the National Socialists are, are part of the alternative for Deutschland. So, so nationalism is gonna put up walls around the world. And again, it's, this is not a reason to pay 20 times earnings, but at the end of the day, David, isn't the US, for all the problems the US has and the debt and everything, isn't it still the best dirty shirt in the laundry? Like, no, no doubt. No doubt. Look, it still has. Uh, I mean, it still it still is, despite all the warts and pimples and scars. It still is the world's reserve currency, and uh, I guess insofar as it has the world's largest army and navy, uh, that will remain the same. But look, the U.S. has a constitution, and the U.S. has something uh, that a lot of other countries don't have, including China, which is called property rights and a rule of law so uh and a court system so yeah look the us uh is still i i completely agree cleanest shirt in the laundry basket is a is a great way to describe it and that's why you know when i talk about owning gold i don't say you own it necessarily against in us dollar terms uh i would be owning it against canadian dollar terms or even sterling or australian dollars uh so remember gold is a pair gold is actually think of gold as a currency that's no country's liability. And so the question is, I always price it in US dollars because that's what they tell me to do on CNBC and Bloomberg TV, but you can actually go long gold and, and then go short another currency and actually uh, improve your financial performance from that pair trade. Well, certainly from the Canadian dollar perspective, almost any currency might might be more attractive than ours. <laughs> Um, well, what about the petro wars around the world? Uh, I mean, that's part of geopolitics today. I mean, the U.S. is not going to go hot nuclear against Russia or China, but they can really fight Russia. Um, and now Russia's fighting back because of the U.S. renaissance in, in with fracking. Uh, I think 
Russia and Saudi Arabia, you know, by the by, have this agreement that until they take two, three million barrels out of the U.S. market, maybe permanently through bankruptcies and other things, that uh, we don't see oil prices recovery. And now they've got the economic climate to do it. What, what do you think about oil? Well, I think the reason why the oil price uh, has bounced back after being negative a few weeks ago uh, is because, uh, well, it, when, when push comes to shove, uh, the Saudis uh, finally got what they wanted. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think there's a country in the world right now as weak as Russia is. When you look at the Russian economic indicators, wow. Uh, and uh, the Saudis also got what they wanted because... And this is what not this did not happen in 2015, 2016. If you remember the last time that the Saudis uh, had the trap door open up under the oil price, the U.S. frackers didn't cut production. Now what's happened? You're looking at the rig count. You're looking at the U.S. production numbers because up until two months ago, the, the U.S. oil industry was still pumping out like 13 million barrels a day. Uh, they have cut back dramatically. They have cut back dramatically. And of course, there's going to be a lot of pain uh, and there will be j job loss. I'm sure you're going to see it in the employment number tomorrow. You, in the last employment number, Larry, uh, which was the, uh, the the March numbers that came out, uh, there was no decline in the energy sector in terms of employment. Just wait till tomorrow. So what you're seeing right now is you're seeing a, a real uh, supply response among the Americans. And so the, the price has gone up. WTI is whatever, $25, it's still nowhere near, it's still nowhere near where it has to be. It has to be much closer to $40 uh, to make oil profitable, uh, even in the U.S. shale industry, in the productive side. So I think that when you ask me about the energy sector, strictly speaking, I mean, we already knew what the ESG movement was doing. It was becoming a, a sector out of favor and difficult for capital to flow into globally. Um, but I still think it's you're investing in energy right now. It's it's a trade. It's something that you might want to rent. You do not want to own energy uh, as a core part of your portfolio. That much I can tell you for a long period of time. Okay. So question from Frank. He Frank's asking, have we considered the technical market fundamentals don't matter anymore? because the Fed is artificially inflating or deflating the market, which means we need to accept that we are pawns and have absolutely no ability to forecast and have been reduced to momentum traders at best. If true, why bother with technical analysis anymore? And one of the things I'm very jealous of, uh, Bob Farrell is, is a legendary technical analyst. And of course, you being at Merrill Lynch had the great opportunity to, to work with Bob. Um, he has these 10 rules and you cite them all the time in, in your research. Um, I've, I've picked out a couple of them here. Uh, the first one I want to look at is bear, bear markets have three stages. They have this sharp down, they have this reflexive rebound, and they have this drawn out fundamental downtrend. And our whole discussion tonight is this point exactly here that we've had this shock we had the sharp down, the sharpest down ever, fastest and sharpest down ever. And now we're in the reflexive rebound or the eye of the storm and everything seems to look good and people are questioning it. You got this fear of missing out. But this last part, okay, this last part is, is pretty critical. And so I've got a chart here to look at this and then we'll look at some of those other points. But, but here it is. This is the bull and bear market phase play out. And if this is the biggest economic shock since the Great Depression, how could this possibly be a V? <laughs> you know, we, we have this economic fallout to come, David. Well, you're 100% right. And let's take a look and see what's happened. Uh, the markets went vertical down uh, from uh, mid-February to mid-March. It was vertical down. As the markets priced in uh, the uh, coronavirus, the lockdowns, the deep recession. Uh, and then, of course, it naturally bounced off those levels and responded to all the policy stimulus. And uh, that's exactly where we are. That's Bob Farrell said reflexive rebound. We're in the reflexive rebound. And then we're into, after this reflexive rebound, you're into the long and drawn out 
decline to the lows. The, those lows could be a few years away. Again, you know what I find very interesting uh, is how people, for whatever reason, just choose to ignore their history. Uh, we had the collapse in October 1929. The market went vertical down for three or four months. Then for a period of about five or six months, we had a 50% rally. And I can only imagine the questions we would be getting back then. <laughs> Look what the Fed's doing. You're going to buy the market. And, and, and you have to be so disciplined. Uh, and you have to have resolve not to follow the herd. Because who knew in that five-month rally after the initial detonation in 1929-30 that we were going to go down 80% to the lows? You can go back to after 9-11. After 9-11, the market closed for about 10 days. It opens up September 21st, 2001. The market goes vertical down. Next thing you know, the Fed, policy stimulus. Oh, and George W. Bush, we had construction and infrastructure, tremendous fiscal stimulus, and the market ripped. The market ripped into the winter of 2002 over four or five months, like a 30% rally. And then it sucked in the suckers. Unfortunately, this happens. And this is why technicals are so important. Technicals are just patterns that recur. And next thing you know, the long and drawn out decline to the lows, 40% down into November 2002. By the way, with a classic technical retest into March of 03. Dare I say, after TARP 1, after Lehman collapse, September of 2008, vertical down, just like we had in February and March this year, vertical down, reflexive rebound. Why? The Fed. And of course, tremendous stimulus. Oh, and by the way, TARP won. And it's going to work. And the market goes up 30%. Only the then go down 40% to the lows. The last part of what Bob Farrell's talking about, the king of technical strategy, is the long and drawn out decline to the lows. And this is what makes it so fascinating is because there's so much psychology here. We're getting more and more questions about the Fed, the Fed, the Fed. The Fed has supposedly had your back every step of the way. And I said earlier, the total return in the wheelchair of 5,000 is no higher today than it was in January 2018. When, by the way, the tax cuts were being implemented by Donald Trump. You've been better off in the past 30 months by rolling over treasury bills at close to 0% than being in the equity market. But you see, people always have to fit or feel they, they have to fit the narrative to the latest price action. Yeah, it's recency bias. Every, everybody gets caught up and they forget their history. They forget the real. And, and I've tried to emphasize in my education of, of the viewers on my show on BNN, you know, remember the history, think about the big picture, don't get caught up in the noise. Here's another question. S&P 500, uh, is it still a good yardstick with all the mega cap stocks making up such a big part of the index and just the math of the index? How can we ever get to those lows? Well, one of the things that but Farrell would talk about is the you know, baby gets thrown. So what was working or what's working? Technology's working. I know you like a lot of technology here. I like a lot of technology, but the markets ultimately don't wash out un until we see the ultimate bottom play out. What I have here, David, on these charts, I have the S&P equal weighted index versus the market cap weighted index. And then I have the big ones. I have Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, and Google and all their performances. And what the chart shows is that just a handful of stocks, in fact, the top 20 stocks in the S&P 500 make up 30% of the index. And I, I know you hate ETFs in, in the sense that you, you got to buy everything um, and you, 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 know, you want to pick the winners. But if you didn't pick these top 20 names, you're, you're screwed. <laughs> Like like your returns have been awful. So so you know the Russell 2000. I mean 30% of those stocks don't even make money, and that was when things were were working. What's that going to look like? So you know it, the question ultimately is: Should we be indexing? Should we be buying or even looking at an index? And and as you mentioned, if you look at an equal weight or a broader index like the value line geometric that looks at what the average stock is doing, 
still down 30% and at the recent lows back to where we were, you know, 20 years ago. So the average stock hasn't really worked. Well, you know, to, again, uh, to invoke uh, our mutual hero, Bob Farrell, uh, you know, one of his market rules is uh, that, you know, the stock market is uh, healthiest uh, when it's broad. And it's unhealthiest when it narrows to a handful of blue chip names. And you have five trillion dollar mega cap stocks that account for 20% of the index. So the answer to the question is, um, you know, the S&P 500 is a very concentrated index. It is not representative. I don't think of anything. Uh, and uh, it's not healthy in the sense that there is such a broad range of divergences. Uh, how can anybody be talking about a bull market, a new bull market? How do you get a new bull market when the bank stocks are almost 60% below their peaks? The bank stocks, the banks, you know, the, the, the sector that the government today is relying on to infuse the small businesses with these PPP loans and grants. Yeah, that sector that's supposed to be the one that's gonna help revitalize the economy, that sector called the banks are down 60%. Uh, the small cap stocks are down almost 30%. The transports are down more than 20%. So despite this bear market rally, which is what it is, uh, when you look beneath the veneer, uh, there's lots of areas of the market that are still in different varying levels of pain. I think that Larry had mentioned uh, the S&P 500 on an equal weight basis. That's still in a bear market. Yeah, that's uh, the so white the white line there is is it's still the, down more uh, than 20. Performing. Yeah, and and actually one of the charts that I like to go with is the ratio of the two. If you look at the ratio of the equal weight uh, to the market cap, it's a pretty frightening chart. It, it's, it's, it's gone down, I think, to its lowest level since uh, the peak of the dot-com craze in 2000. Yeah, uh, the, which, the, 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 the average, the average stock is performing. Let me go back to something socialist that we were talking about before and the inequality in the world. So there's inequality at the income level. There's inequality in the stock market with some few stocks uh, lifting the boat, uh, so to speak, and, and causing this veneer that isn't really real. What is the risk that a uh, democratically controlled uh, Congress and, and White House uh, goes after some of these names on antitrust and tries to break them up? Very high chance that that's going to happen in, in big tech. And I think more to the point, uh, and this is going to happen anyways, by the way, this will happen more quickly uh, if we have uh, the Democrats uh, in the, uh, not just in the executive branch, but the le legislative branches. And this is very important, especially if you're investing in stocks, because stocks represent capital, not labor. Uh, there will be higher tax rates on capital gains. I have virtual 100% conviction in that call. There will be higher taxes on dividends. There will be higher taxes on corporate income. My prediction in the next few years is that the entire Trump corporate tax cut, even under Joe Biden, who, by the way, has been pushed to the left from his friend Bernie Sanders, that the corporate tax cuts get repealed. And that's when people say to me about the stock market, you see, I'll just make this point. The bulls say to me, and you always have to listen and appreciate the other side of the argument because you can't afford to have blind spots. But the bulls will say, yes, we had this deep recession. Yes, we had this deep hit to earnings, but it didn't affect normalized earnings. My normalized 10-year earnings forecast didn't really change that much. And by the way, whatever dent was put in was already priced in in February and March. But people haven't factored in what taxation is going to look like in that 10-year normalized earnings. And so the valuations that people are working with right now in the stock market are probably misapprehensions 
uh, and misplaced valuations in terms of what you're really paying for it in the future and after tax terms. We're, we're, we're running a little tight on time, only a few minutes left, so I want to wrap it up here. Um, it's been a great discussion. You know, so there's 10 points here. You put in one of your recent points on why the multiple's too high. And you did talk about the cyclically adjusted PE and we're still very, very high. W what would earnings be? Just a back of the envelope calculation. If we didn't have all this corporate debt and, and buying back all these stocks, w would earnings be 20% less than they are? Um, I, I'd say that, um... Yeah, 20% is probably right. And I can tell you that what's very interesting is that when you're watching the television shows, you're always looking at earnings per share. It's always earnings per share. If you look at dollar level of earnings, the $2 trillion chunk of earnings in the corporate sector writ large, Larry, they haven't budged in five years. And yet what happened is that with this borrowing binge that didn't go into capital expenditure, unfortunately, it went into stock buybacks. The share count of the S&P 500 has gone down to its lowest level in 20 years. And that's how you give, by the way, remember your term Potemkin. Yeah. Potemkin applies to the earnings cycle because the big boost to earnings was the denominator. It was the share count. And so 20 percent, uh, I'd say 20 to 30 percent easily was juiced up uh, by what I call the biggest bull market in financial engineering in modern history. Well, not not to mention the non-GAAP earnings that we go by, not not the real earnings. Uh, so, you know, maybe the base earnings rate is 80 to $100, not, not 150 or 160 that somehow they, they normalize it out to be. And I think that would be uh, very, very optimistic. Let's wrap with talking about some of your bullish picks here. Uh, you love uh, the cloud. I love the cloud. Uh, video streaming, anything that's going to help our home life uh, be better. So technology in general, healthcare services, utilities, residential REITs, very important, not commercial REITs, residential REITs, semiconductors, anything to to service service industry. This is a, a you've got a massive buy list. You're bullish. David Rosenberg is bullish. There's lots of stuff here to buy, folks. Um, you know, this, this is there's all there's a bull market somewhere. I, I have a very similar list. There's there's lots of things here we can own. We don't have to own the index. We we, we really don't. So uh, I love that you have a great list here. I've got a similar list. We're we're running out of time. I wanted to close the uh, presentation with a special offer and really an introduction for the world because you've been on your own for just a couple of months now. And and um, so Rosenberg Research, an independent global uh, research stop, you, you, you are looking for the blind spots. You are trying to help investors find, not only giving them good investment ideas, um, but find the places in the world, best places in the world to invest. And it's not just about equities. So for everybody online today, you can either click on the link that you're going to get in the email tomorrow, or you can go to David's website, send him an email, give them a phone call, one month free trial. This is some of the best research and reading that you're going to do if you want to understand the big picture and, and you know hold that world in, in your hand. So David, thank you so, so much for being here. I wanted to tease the audience what, what everyone would think of David and I running a bull and bear fund, like a long and short fund together. Wouldn't that be exciting? So, uh, so that might be something to think about too one day. Uh, in any case, let's leave that there. Um, if you can make a donation to one of our charities, these are all free educational events. Please do. Uh, my partners and I will be thrilled to match your, your donations to either leukemia research uh, and cancer research in general at the Sick Kids or dementia and Alzheimer's research through the Baycrest Hospital and Foundation here in Toronto, one of the world leaders in that area. Thanks again for joining us again tonight. Thank you, David. Take advantage of this free trial. You will not be disappointed. Have a great evening, everybody, and shelter in place. Be Thanks, safe, David. be healthy, thank, and thank you. That was awesome and a lot of fun.